Live from downtown Detroit, Local 4 News at 6 starts now. There it is on Exact Track 4D radar. A lot of green, a little bit of light blue, too, and that means a chance of light snow as you're getting out and about on the roads. And we have some winter weather advisories yeah. to talk about, too. Kim Adams is tracking it all for us for one weather forecast. Hi, Kim. I was just getting an update because we have seen a changeover just within the last few minutes spread a little bit further into Macomb County. So I wanted the latest information here on exact track 40 radar. Utica is getting just a rain snow mix also in Sterling Heights. Now it spreads up into Macomb. Romeo and Richmond, however, have light snow showers. And then as you head back out to the west in Rochester Hills, Pontiac, Waterford, Oxford and Ortonville, also in West Bloomfield, it is all light snow showers. That winter weather advisory, though, is nowhere near us. That is all the way up in the thumb. It's for Sanilac County and then up into the Bad Axe area where they expect two to three inches overnight tonight and through the day tomorrow. But around here, if you live south of M59, you'll barely get anything, maybe a half inch on the grassy areas further to the west could be an inch or so, but most of it will fall again on the grassy area as the ground is still quite warm. Temperatures right now we are closely monitoring because they are just at or below freezing in many areas. Pontiac's at 32. The reason it's raining in downtown Detroit, temperatures are still above freezing also in parts of Monroe County as well because you get that influence from Lake Erie. Also in the city of Detroit, the urban heat island. So it's a little bit warmer, supporting more in the way of rain. I'll have a look at what your morning commute will look like coming up in just a few minutes. All right, Kim, in fact, we urge you to wake up with us. Be sure to tune in to Local 4 News from 4.30 to 7 a.m. for the latest on forewarn on the forecast and any potential snags there might be in the morning drive. If you get a little bit later of a start, then tune in to the 7 a.m. show, which you'll find on Local 4 Plus. All right, we continue to follow breaking news from Detroit's west side where police opened fire on a suspect following a short chase. This all happened uh, about 20 minutes after 3 this afternoon in the area of Joy Road in Strathmore. Police say officers stopped the driver for an improper license plate. They say he got out of the SUV and just took off. An officer fired at least one shot during a chase, hitting the man in the thigh. He's in the hospital in serious condition. A gun and ski mask was recovered. Now police are looking for a suspect that got away in what's believed to be a Chevy Suburban or Tahoe. It has a Michigan license plate, the plate number ELY6819. New charges and new information in the case of a woman found dead in the back of a pickup truck in Roseville. This happened last month. Stephen Freeman had previously been charged with concealing a person's death and receiving and concealing stolen property. The charges added today by the Macomb County prosecutor much more serious than that. Jacqueline Francis is live in Roseville for us tonight. And Jacqueline, uh, we're talking about a murder charge, and that comes with a more detailed version of events from investigators. It does. Police say 19 year old Stephen Freeman broke into the victim's house last month when she wasn't there. We're told when she got home, the two got into a fight and she was killed. 62 year old Gabrielle Seitz's murder shocked and puzzled the community. Her dead body was found in the back of a pickup truck near Hayes and Common in Roseville last month. The truck had just been in a crash, the driver taking off on foot. The alleged driver, 19-year-old Stephen Freeman, was initially charged with concealing a body, but is now charged with murder. Prosecutor Pete Lucido says forensic evidence ties Freeman to the crime scene. There's fingerprints that were found in the residence of the dwelling of where the deceased um, you know, lived. So based on some other technical evidence that's coming back, such as DNA, there's enough to make the felony murder. Police say Freeman broke into the victim's house when she wasn't there. When she arrived home, they say the two got into a fight and she was killed. There's also some cameras that were stationed outside the home where you pick up uh, the information as well as the identity of the individual taking the body out of the home. When asked about motive or if the two knew one another, the prosecutor answered. Nobody's asked that question. If I had that crystal ball, I'd give you the answer. But it's unfortunate that I don't know whether or not there was any relationship. Was this at random? The victim was found with a shoelace around her neck, and while the suspected cause of death is strangulation, officials are still waiting for the official report from the medical examiner. Reporting live in Roseville, Jacqueline Francis, Local 4. Yeah, okay, Jacqueline, thanks.
Prosecutors are going to seek a life sentence with no parole for Ethan Crumbly in the Oxford High School shooting. It comes three weeks after the 16 year old pleaded guilty to all 24 charges against him, including murder and terrorism. A first degree murder conviction typically brings an automatic life sentence in Michigan. Teenagers, though, are entitled to a hearing in which their attorney can raise mental health and other issues in arguing for a shorter sentence. Sentencing process set to start in February of next year. There is growing concern tonight for Mohammed Salem, the local man detained in the Middle East. He's from Melvindale and traveled to Saudi Arabia to visit a sacred building in Mecca. An argument in line led to his arrest, and now we've learned he's been moved to a higher security prison. Sean Lay broke this story for us a week ago and joins us live with the latest. Sean, this move has really ratcheted up fears for his safety. Kimberly, you're exactly right. His case going worldwide now, getting worldwide attention. But here's the deal. Mohammed Salem from Melvindale was arrested and detained November 1st. Here we are November 15th. Today we learn he's moved to a maximum security facility in Saudi Arabia and all contact with his family here at home and in Saudi Arabia with sons are there has been cut off. So since we last spoke, uh, Mohammed has been moved to Dahban Central Prison, which is a maximum security prison, which is known to house terrorists. Attorney Abdullah Mogni meets with the Melvindale family of Mohammed Salem every day, and he says they're terrified. Their 63-year-old father has been arrested and jailed in Saudi Arabia and hasn't been charged with a crime. Contact with him has been cut off, and he's been moved to the Dahban Central Prison for terrorists, all over a comment he made about burning the country down after he lost his temper in a security line. Tweets in Saudi Arabia reporting Salem's arrest read that Saudi soldiers thwarted a terror plot. From the Saudi perspective, they caught a terrorist. They had somebody who was plotting against the government and they thwarted it. But that is not the case at all. Mohammed was a visitor trying to have a spiritual journey at Hajj. He lost his temper and unfortunately said something that he probably shouldn't have. And because of that, he's facing some of the most dire consequences anyone on earth could face. They truly did not expect it to get this bad. They were kind of just hoping once the Saudi Arabian government had realized the severity and, and whether Mohammed is a threat, he would be released. Um, but it's just gotten worse over time. And at this point, they're assuming the worst may happen. Back here live, the family attorney there, Abdullah Modni, saying the worst could be a long sentence or even something that the family doesn't even want to think about at this point. But they don't understand why he wasn't quickly vetted. He's 63 years old, lives here in Melvindale, has 10 kids, and then put on a plane and sent home. That hasn't happened. He is in a maximum security prison right now. Sources telling us, however, the highest levels, Kimberly, of the U.S. government now working on this very sensitive situation. Yeah, Back sensitive and scary indeed, and 10 children. My goodness. All right, Sean, thank you. A local family is desperate for answers about what happened to their grandfather, who was found dead on a local freeway. Michael Thomas was hit by more than one vehicle, apparently, before his body was eventually found on I-96 near Livernois in Detroit. Victor Williams live with how the family is dealing with all of this grief, which, uh, Victor, is, comes with so many unanswered questions right now. Yes, that is correct. And this is just such a horrible way to go, Devin. That 72 year old's body was found on I-96. And since then, so much more has become a mystery. It was tragic because I can just imagine a dog on a freeway when I ride past and I see them all hit up in deers. Like, I figured that's probably how my granddad looked like raw meat just spread it across the freeway. Brittany Lipsy hates thinking of how her grandfather died on Halloween night. Roadkill. That's exactly what I imagine. Michael Thomas's body was found in the right lane of the eastbound side of I-96 near Livernois around 2 a.m. Investigators say his body was hit multiple times, yet no one stopped to check on him. I do understand people traveling on the freeway at high speeds or rates. They're probably not paying attention, especially at 2 in the morning. They could have been texting or anything, but I know if I was on the freeway and I felt I hit something that hard, I would have wanted to turn around and see what I hit. A lot of the story is just unusual. Many loved ones like Brittany are now looking for answers. The 72-year-old was found on the interstate 30 minutes away from his home in Royal Oak. Last anyone heard from him was around 8 p.m. that same evening. 
I'm really just trying to find out how he ended up on the freeway. He texted his girlfriend at 836 and told her good night he was going to bed. So he doesn't even usually leave the house after 9 o'clock. As of now, the investigation is still open. According to Michigan State Police, officers did smell alcohol on Thomas's body. Either way, that doesn't say much about how he ended up on the interstate to begin with. He usually rides his bike, but I know he didn't ride his bike that late. So he was just a chill, cool guy. He just pretty much stayed in the house, kept to himself. Michael now leaves behind multiple grandchildren that now have to grow up in his absence. Victor Williams, local four. Awful. All right, Victor. A slight increase in Michigan's new coronavirus numbers for the week. The state is reporting 12,860 new cases over the past seven days. That averages out to 1,837 cases per day. It's 2,868 more cases cases more than last week. 123 new deaths are also being reported over that same time period. At a cemetery in Wyandotte, damage to some headstones has the attention of police. Now, these are pictures taken by an officer who responded to Oakwood Cemetery near Biddle and Ford Avenue. The headstones, including one belonging to a World War II veteran, had been pushed or kicked off their bases. One headstone even had a pumpkin smashed on it. Uh, they have all been since cleaned and restored, but if you've got any information on who did it, Wyandotte police are asking you to call.